I love countdowns. <laughs> Rocket guys. <laughs> yeah, this is very easy. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to AIP.com. My name is Jack Dobson, AIP lead at Palantir, and it's my absolute pleasure to welcome you to the event. Uh, we've got about kind of 11, 12 minutes until our keynotes begin here at AIPCon, um, but we're very excited to have a little bit of a pre-show, especially for all of you watching on the live stream. Luckily, you don't have to just listen to me for about 10 minutes. I am joined by an awesome panel of both customers and also our chief architect. So perhaps, Dan, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, Dan Jablonski, I'm the CEO and chairman of Ursa Major. Uh, Ursa Major does hypersonic rocket vehicles and uh, tactical missile configurations for the Defense Department as well as in-space maneuverability uh, capabilities for the entire commercial and space industry. And we're really excited to be here. We're moving from a phase of rapid development to rapid industrialization, and I'm really excited to be here to talk about warp speed. Awesome, thank you so much, Dan. And equally, we've also got Bernardo on the other end of our panel. Tell us a bit more about what you're here today for. Yeah, so Bernardo Rodriguez, I'm the Chief Digital Officer of JD Power. We are a company that focuses on data analytics for the auto industry. We have a large uh, number of data sets for the, data, for the auto industry, and we use Palantir and AI to solve problems for our clients, which are basically OEMs and dealer groups. Excellent. And we also joined by a face that may be familiar to you guys, Akshay from Palantir. Good to be with everybody. I'm just happy to be here with you, Jack, and with everyone here on the panel. So let's let's jump in. Let's jump into it. Yeah. So as I say, we've got about 10 minutes to kind of tee up a pre-show for, for you guys. We're going to be fully jumping straight into product. The goal of this little session is to sort of tee up a lot of the keynotes you're going to be seeing in just about 10 minutes and sort of land what is AIP in 2025. We are in a new year of AIP, a new year of AIP cons, our sixth edition, and we want to kind of hit it right out of the gate with what is new in product. What are some of the concepts and the themes that we are driving with our customers at the front line. So with that, we're actually going to jump straight into product and kind of talk through some of the concepts to be keeping an eye out for throughout the keynotes today. Awesome. So we're actually going to be sort of following the journey of a notional company for the sake of this sort of demonstration. But we're going to be walking through some of those core concepts that are going to be prime for AIP in 2025. These are all concepts that customers like Dan, Bernardo, and others here at AIPCon are already building on. This is not future product. This is stuff that's available today. And this is sort of a culmination of what we're seeing in terms of how our customers are forwarding their missions with Palantir. I'm going to tee it up very quickly, and then I'd love to sort of get Dan and Bernardo's take. In fact, actually, I think right out of the gate, the key thing with this company, which is called Onyx Incorporated, it's a notional company, but it's a medical products manufacturer and distributor. Now, the key thing with Onyx is they are running all of their real-time decision-making operations on Palantir. That is, Palantir is essentially the foundation for the core mission of Onyx. Everything they do that forwards the state machine of the business, the decisions that they're making in the real world, that is powered by Palantir. So we're going to talk a lot about mission today. We always talk about Palantir powering the missions of our customers and the, the movements they make in the world. Perhaps, Dan, I'm going to jump to you first. When we talk about Ursa Major, when you think about being mission-driven and your mission in the world, what does that mean to you? Well, it means to us delivering world-class products over and over and over again to the people that protect Western democracies and our freedom. You know, you, it's like this zero chance for error when you're thinking about uh, national security needs, space-based operations, uh, hypersonic vehicles that, that you know, have temperatures inside of them at five to 6,000 degrees and rotate at 50 to 60,000 RPM. So bringing in the various disparate data sets into how we do those productions is we, we, we have to get it right, we have to get it right every time, and we can't have uh, move at the speed of human capacity. Mm -hmm. That's why it's so important to, to bring the diff disparate data sets together to be able to, to be always on top of our customer mission. So, yeah, I, it's, yeah. It's, Take, so taking us from almost like the stratosphere from space right down to on the ground, J.D. Powell, what does mission mean to you, Bernardo? Yeah, so our, our, our job is to solve our clients' biggest problems, right? If you think about the auto industry, there are large problems, like multi-billion dollar problems around warranty reduction or uh, incentive optimization, tens of billions of dollars. So we're using the data that we have accumulated and build applications in, uh, on Palantir to help our clients solve that problem. We spend a lot of time doing that over the last couple of years, and now we're jumping into the very exciting world of mm -hmm. integrating LLMs uh, into that, those workflows mm -hmm. to bring AI to the, to the core of the problems, and we're seeing great results so far. Awesome. Now, actually, I'm not going to let you get away that easily. Yeah. I think the big theme when it comes to powering the missions of our customers, we always say taking our customers from being great institutions to dominant institutions. 
a lot of that requires not just building simple use cases and like point solutions, right? It requires sort of redefining the core operations of the business. I think ultimately, actually, what that requires is building a brand new enterprise operating system that underpins these operations. That's very much how we think about it and how we try to set the ambition. It's like, I think you've heard it well, I think from, from both of our co-panelists here, which is you need to model more than just simply the data environment. It's, it's the logic, it's the action, it's being able to build a model of the world you can then actually reason about and act through to, to power your missions mm -hmm. and also to bring automation into that frame progressively over time so it actually makes sense given the criticality of the operations that you guys and many others are taking forward. 100%, and speaking of automation, bringing it back to Onyx, this is a core founding tenet of everything that Onyx is doing in the real world now as part of this notional demo. All of the core functions of Onyx Incorporated are now agent-driven at their foundation. So all of these core workflows you see on the screen, order fulfillment, the journey of every customer order from inception to delivery, maintenance, the tasking of technicians to every production line globally, where these would all previously be constrained to the human operator, we now have this concept of human AI teaming driving all of these core flows. Maybe actually, can you talk more towards our approach to agents and what that actually means for customers like Dan and Bernardo in the real world? Absolutely, so I think that we, we hear a lot about the, the power of agents, the power of automation out there, but I think you know when you work in critical operations, we need to actually operate in the world, it has to be a shared foundation between agents and automation and humans. And so a lot of what you see with the ontology system and what you'll see, I think, throughout the remainder of this is how do we bring AI into the same frame the same guardrails, access the same tools that humans use today to make decisions, so we can actually treat it like an analog dial we're turning up as opposed to some sort of bit flip that you know, maybe works for a, a very simple consumer environment, but not for the environments that these folks work in. I love it, makes total sense. And maybe let's actually look at one of those automations, right? So we're now in the world of order fulfillment. We're looking at customer order operations, mm -hmm. the journey from e like every order from inception to delivery. What you're seeing on the screen now is happening in real time. Our agents are picking up these new customer orders that are hitting my system. And as these orders move from the left of the screen to the right of the screen, this isn't just a simple chatbot or point solution. This is a chain set of agents automating one of these core foundational functions of the business. And you'll see this sort of concept as these orders, in this case, move from the left to the right of the screen. Certain orders will be bumped out of that automated flow by our agents for our users to action. Now, I'm going to pass to Dan in a second to talk about like, how you're thinking about automation at Ursa sure. Major. And I think the key thing for you guys on the live stream to keep an eye on is, all of our keynotes are really pushing the boundaries of this in the field. We're seeing pretty much every company that's going to be up here on stage has really sort of reframed, redefined their operations around this agentic framework. So, Dan, as you're sort of on the start of that journey, you're one of our like cohort of warp speed customers now. What does automation mean to you? How are you thinking about that in the context of uh, some major? Yeah, so, I mean, starting with rocket technology, it's really, really hard to get it right. Mm -hmm. It's really, really hard to take something from a design to production. Uh, it's really hard to do it once, but then to do it 10 times, then 100 times, then 1,000 yeah. times at scale, that's tremendously hard. We've got lots of different data sets coming in. We've got lots of different uh, things that we measure along that, and they're not just large language models, yeah. right? There's all kinds of ontologies coming in, all kinds of test data. How we pull all of that together into a comprehensive visual solution that humans can interact with is something that's really hard that Palantir has been solving. So we're, you know, that's how we're going to mold that into our, our capabilities. That's incredible, and maybe actually that's the perfect segue. Jumping under the hood of this workflow, this is not possible without an ontology, right? And I think, right. Bernardo, I'd love to get your take. You've, um, you actually were one of our first keynote presenters at the first edition of AIPCon. I think so much has changed about the product, like the audience are going to see that today yeah. throughout the keynotes, yeah. but one thing that hasn't changed is ontology, right? Yeah. So as we think about this circuitry that sits behind these automations, these agents, what does ontology mean to JD Power? Yeah. I, I think that that is the foundation of, I think, what makes this platform very special. Because you have uh, this object representation at the same time, you have a lot of security yep. that makes sure all the clients involved that mm -hmm. there's a lot of care being taken care of the data. Now, the next level is, in my mind, the iteration speed. Yeah. Because you're able to build solutions either with simple workflows all the way to more complex agents and AI-driven solutions mm -hmm. with very fast iteration yep. speed, which compounds and allows you to build a solution that at the end is way more effective. So uh, security and speed and iteration for me are the key on 
what ontology allows you to do in the platform. 100%. And I like that idea of almost like a sort of um, a flywheel that's running Correct. faster and yep. faster. The marginal cost of every new use case, every new automation yep. gets lower and lower, Correct. right? And maybe actually, you mentioned there the idea of permissioning and some of the architectural components. Dipping under the hood one level further, actually, talk to us about multimodal data plane, this sort of yeah. foundational concept that all of Palantir, all of AIP is built on. What does that mean for our customers in the field? Yeah, this is a big step forward on the data and the compute architecture of the platform to allow people to have freedom to integrate all the relevant streaming, structured, unstructured, media sources together even if they exist in other data platforms or other model environments, so you can actually interlink them all into the ontology and drive these workflows. I think, as, as you said, repeatedly, not just once or in a one-off way, but in an enterprise-grade way with all the security permissions that could be role-based, marking-based, and multimodal in all sorts of other ways, too. 100%. I think we always talk about the idea that ultimately our customers' missions should not be constrained to the requirements or the limits of their software, exactly. right? You shouldn't be shaping your business to the software, you should be shaping your software to the business. I think MNDP is exactly the example of that. So, I mean, zooming out, I think the key thing, as we kind of go into our last few minutes, we're going to talk a lot about the logic behind all of this, like how we build these agents. Maybe, uh, Bernardo, I'm curious, you, um, your first ever keynote at AIPCon sort of began in the chat world, right? Like a sort of customer-facing workflow. Yeah. I imagine since June of 2023, you've come a long way in terms of how you're thinking about implementing AIP yeah. and logic within yeah. your enterprise as well. Yeah. So talk me through kind of where you're at at the bleeding edge at this point. Yeah, so right now we're, thinking first, AI first, mm -hmm. and agentic first. We yeah. used to think before more deterministic flows, mm -hmm. right? So for us to add that on deterministic nature of behavior is what is, yeah, we're discovering how to do that well. Mm -hmm. So far, great results. Uh, and how AIP integrates LLMs, we're doing some work with XAI on your team right now, yeah. for example. Uh, try to see how uh, through agents you can optimize the data to fit in the context window of the LLMs, mm -hmm. be able to make decisions. So we're moving that into a world where the agent is the, the, the protagonist, basically, of the workflow, mm -hmm. and not simply a, a tool that is used in those workflows. 100%, and perhaps, Dan, as we start, as we kind of think through that circuitry that sits behind these workflows, as one of our newest Warp Speed customers, maybe could you talk us through kind of in those, in those conversations you were no doubt having and the demos, what was the sure. thing that stood out to you, particularly? Like, what was the, the linchpin that you made you realize, hang on, this is a game changer? I think the biggest thing was, was watching how the, the, the circuitry gets wired so that uh, lots of different data sources that don't talk to each other that a human would have to go aggregate suddenly become a lot more seamless and then you can use your agentic kind of uh, functionality yep. to with the ontologies you want to create to customize it towards your needs. So that we're really excited about that piece of it because um, that's hard. Cool. Like and we're, we're a small company yet growing very fast but we've got like 60 disparate ones already, and I've yeah. been speaking with people this morning, they've got 600 to 1,000 different data, disparate data sources coming in. So yeah. it gets you know, exponentially harder each time. We can build on this foundation to make that a scalable, easier part of what we're going to do. 100%, and yeah. it's all about embracing that complexity, right? Like, we're yeah. not going to turn to you and say, actually, you need to templatize all of those operations or right. have every manufacturing plant operate the same. It's actually about embracing the fact that there are nuances, there is uniqueness, and that's actually what makes you guys special. That's what serves the mission the best. So, right. we're going to make sure the software shapes to that, right? Including some proprietary stuff that we've developed Absolutely. that, you know, doesn't necessarily wire into anybody else's exact. Yeah, business. leveraging the stuff yeah. you already have. Right. 100%. And real quick, I think the important thing is we talk about these agents in, in uh, operation, in like actual active deployment. Talk to me a little bit about evals. How do we yeah. think about ensuring that as we deploy these agents, the, the engine, the business is actually ticking up and performing as we'd expect? Absolutely, so uh, you know, the idea of evals is, is sort of a, a bit of a concept from the software engineering world, but now it's, the question has been how do you actually operationalize them in the world of AI? And what we think this means is you actually have to be able to evaluate every segment of an AI-driven workflow. Understand performance using different types of grading rubrics. So those could be qualitative grades, quantitative grades, unit tests that have to run over specific units that have to pass every time. And you have to have the flexibility to figure out what the right evals are for every single process because ultimately that is what builds trust. 100%, and I think speaking of building trust, that sort of brings us back to that human AI teaming element, right? So as we zoom back out in this example to our inventory manager view, we have that handoff point, right, where our agent has worked autonomously up to this point, but now we bring the operator back in. We actually allow the operator to apply their expertise to the subset of actions, the subset of decisions that uniquely require their input, right? And what we see on the screen now is this idea of this action log. So 
the beauty of building on the ontology is the fact that every single component, every single decision that's made gets mapped back into that ontology, right? It becomes a composable asset, and that's applicable to both our agents working within these workflows and our human operators as well. So we can actually see that those decisions are coming together. So I think as we come to sort of wrap this up, we've landed some of these human AI teaming concepts. These are going to be foundational principles that you're going to see throughout the keynote. So we're very excited to have you all here on the live stream. Obviously, keep tuning in. Any final words, Dan? Excited for the rest of the day here at AIPCOM? Massively excited, and, and, and especially to be able to be in the ecosystem with the other people that are doing this and learning more and more and more. Amazing. Fantastic. And Bernardo, excited to have you again. Yeah, what are you most lot. excited for about this particular AIPCOM? It's just understanding uh, how agentic uh, flows are being built and how AI is being integrated. Excellent, brilliant. Well, thank you both for joining us. Thank you, Akshay, thank you, for coming along as well. Stay tuned, our keynotes will be kicking off very shortly. Welcome to AIPCOM. Thanks.